chairman of the um, X Org boards and also vice president of software for the One Laptop Per Child project. He will of course speak about One Laptop, one laptop Per Child. Jim. Thank you. Um, this is a picture of a school in a rural middle of nowhere in Cambodia. It's about six hours from right there. Uh, Nicholas Negroponte built a couple of schools a few years ago and discovered that the cost of the laptops were really expensive. And the cost of the fuel for generators to get laptops were really expensive. It was quite eye-opening. Um, it's one thing I'll start with. I want to try to reset people's view of the world here. The first problem was when the kids were given laptops was persuading the parents to let them use the laptops when they were taken home because laptops were worth more than the houses that they were going home to. Once, once they got past that point, the next problem, the next realization of a day or two later was for most of these kids, this was the first time there was any artificial light in their house. That's the bulk of the world. Most kids go home at night to houses with no electricity and no light. Okay, so um, this is sort of what I'm going to cover in this talk. In some sense, uh, this being a geek audience, um, I'm going to try to adjust or explain to you why we designed the machine the way we did. We've had the luxury which Linux people typically have, and free, free software people have not had, of actually being able to design our own hardware um, from close to scratch. This has allowed us a set of freedoms of design that, that you typically don't have, and um, is uh, allowed us to go in directions that, that you normally can't do in the Microsoft ecology. At least not unless you're Microsoft. Um, there's realities about hardware design that a lot of people don't fully appreciate. It is very different than, than software. There are realities of what, of what ingredients you can actually get to, to make your sausage. And you can only make as much sausage as you can actually get, get the, the ingredients for. It isn't like software where you can always run off a few million more copies. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. Some parts of the, of the recipe you can substitute. That, those are called second sources. But other parts you can't. They're single source suppliers, and if they stop being able to make your component, you're in real trouble. Um, if you make a lot of sausage, you can actually get some custom ingredients made. And depending upon how long in advance you start, depends upon how unique and new the ingredient can be. So, full custom VLSI is like a three year lead time. Uh, you can build an ASIC in as little as three or four months if you know what you're doing. You actually build a couple of application specific ICs in, in the machine, uh, the machines that we have here. This is the so-called B-Test 2 machine. It's the second uh, um, uh, beta test build that we've done. Um, so, in any case, what we're out to do is to, is to educate kids or help them educate themselves. That's what we're about. We're not about free software per se. However, you will see how the two go hand in hand in this talk. Um, there's something of order one to one and a half billion children in the, in the developing world. This is a lot of kids. Um, so if you do the math, how many machines per year should we be doing if we could build a machine that lasts five years? How many laptops were built last year? Does anybody know in this audience? Uh, I think it's like 65 million, 70 million, something like that. You can see that, that if we do this for real, we should end up building a lot more laptops than everybody else put together. This is the reality of what a school in the capital city of Nigeria looks like. Okay? This school is fortunate. It has electricity in one room. There's, none, there's no lights, no nothing in the regular classroom. And that's the capital city. You go outside of the capital city in Nigeria, it doesn't get better, it gets worse. 
another picture of kids from, uh, from that school, I believe. Another thing I want you to think about is, is again, I had, I had breakfast with someone this morning who had never focused on the fact that most kids only get, say, five or six years of elementary education. So the people we are trying to serve, the kids we're trying to serve, are the young kids. Not the middle schoolers, not the high schoolers, to which we have been primarily catering. We're trying to fundamentally help kids who are learning to read and getting their, help, their very basic education. And in some parts of the world, however, what we consider to be, what you consider a basic education is quite interesting. I was talking to a guy named Greg Mortensen, who's been building schools in very northern Pakistan. And by the time those kids leave fifth grade, they have, they have learned five languages. Quite impressive. But you have to. In any case, if we just continue the way we're going, um, that's a risk by itself. Doing nothing is a risk. Computers and education in the developing world is, is quite old. That's an Apple too. Uh, it's Seymour there, who unfortunately was badly injured a few months ago. Um, this is, I think, from, well, whenever Apple IIs were current, so that would be late 1960s or something like that. So this is not a flash in the pan. The difference is we're trying to do this at scale because we believe that there are network effects that take place when every child has a machine. We're called one laptop per child for a very good reason. We don't believe that sharing machines or computer labs are an effective way for, for kids to use them. Do we share our pencils? Very hard to use it as a, as a basic, as your book if you're trying to share. It's hard for two people to read the same book at the same time. So we really mean what we say. We say one laptop per child. It's the basic premise of the project. Okay, so there's lots of interest from all over the world. We're likely to launch in the countries that are green here, though Thailand is iffy, uh, courtesy of the change of government. Um, that always makes things much more entertaining. Um, governments are not necessarily safe. Um, our premise is that kids all over the world, and this is true so long as they get a decent uh, you know, nutrition, are just as bright all over the world as they are here. Um, so we think that if we can get machines into the hands of every kid, that this is a really fundamental tool. This presents a huge set of challenges, though, of course, you might imagine. Another point of view is we don't believe that kids are just passive consumers of, quote, content from the content providers of the world. We believe that kids are creative. Uh, those of you who have children, almost certainly your children keep journals, at least in their early years. Uh, as you may know, reading and writing are intimately related, and so writing a journal is something that's, that's fundamental. I've watched my own daughter um, uh, uh, now in fifth or sixth grade be able to, to actually write English reasonably well, which is uh, quite remarkable. Um, this is a program called Pan Pan Center Development. Um, this particular version isn't out yet, um, but the intent is for kids to be able to compose their own music. The other thing is, we want kids to be able to experiment. Okay? Um, this funny gizmo on the left, um, we did this for, for a demo of the so-called ATEST boards at a conference uh, last May or thereabouts. Um, that's a photo cell on the end of a, of a wooden spoon. The photo cell costs less than a dollar. Um, this allows you to conduct music. Because you can uh, detect what the light is and figure out what the, what the rhythm that you want to get. Just by detecting what the light is. So we want it to be very easy to plug things in. So one of the unique things about this machine is that the, the audio port can also be used just for DCM. Make a, you, can, you can use it as an A to B converter rather than just, the, just for audio. The network is really fundamental. Um, we want the kids to be able to share. We want kids to be able to work together. If you watch your own children uh, with their friends, you'll often see two kids in front of a machine busily teaching each other about the uh, particular thing they're they're playing with. Um, 
Similarly, we want the teachers to be able to work with the children. Um, so the network is really fundamental. However, this again brings a whole set of huge challenges. There is no infrastructure in many parts or most parts of the world. How do we get the network out to the middle of nowhere? So there's, um, yeah, so we believe it's just as important that the kids communicate with each other as with the internet. Now, we want them to get at the internet in a serious way, so, so the intent is, in fact, to get internet connectivity to all the schools. Depending upon where you are, there's either good or terrible connectivity. Um, Thailand, for example, has 30,000 schools. They claim to have connected all 30,000 of them. On the other hand, if you go to Nigeria, you get a very different answer. Our point of view is that you can actually build networks on your own very cheaply, if you know how. Um, and the other observation is, for a lot of things like cell phones, um, bandwidth that isn't being used it goes onto the floor. So there's interesting games you can play by, by governments twisting arms of cell phone carriers to you know, allow the bandwidth that's not being used for revenue-paying phone calls to go toward, toward internet connectivity. Um, this is a... Uh, uh, something in the middle of nowhere, and I think it was Pakistan, uh, done some years ago, setting up a network. Uh, this is going across the uh, disputed border from Pakistan into Kashmir, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, you know, these kind of radios are now very cheap. You can build them out of it if you want. This is a picture um, taken of somebody hacking away in um, downtown uh, Athens, it turns out. Um, making their own network out of, out of cheap components. So what we're intending to do out of all of this is um, actually ship what's called mesh networking. The individual computers are able to forward packets on behalf of nearby computers. Uh, you also notice that our, we actually have antennas that stick up. That makes a significant difference in the, in the um, sensitivity of the radios. Um, James Cameron has been doing experiments in the outback of Australia, which is about as good as it ever gets. Um, so it's at least one extreme of what you can do with 802.11, even without directional antennas. Uh, when, when he's had line of sight, he's gotten up to, to I think it's nearly two kilometers, which I'm really amazed by. Um, I don't think that would be the more realistic thing, of course, is sort of 400 meters. And then, of course, you start thinking about meshes of map meshes with that get interconnected by various point-to-point um, -point sorts of links. Um, and then you have to backhaul however you can back to the internet. Um, so that's the kind of, of architecture that we're working on. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about, about how that's driven the hardware design here. Um, I'm going to go into what our, our design trade-offs have been, since this is not the typical laptop. Um, Obviously, we care about it being um, safe, and you aren't going to—you really don't want to have a, a three-kilogram laptop on a six-year-old. Okay, it needs to be pretty light. Um, you also have a feature that, that can be smaller than usual, uh, because guess what? Kids are a lot smaller than we are. Um, kids like things that look, look you know, like toys. Um, it has to be low power. They're, uh, some people think, oh, we should ship all the laptops and or desktops we don't use anymore here to the developing world. Well, as I demonstrated before, the numbers don't work just in terms of quantity. And then you think about the power plants required to power these things. Conventional laptops are often consuming 25 watts. You ship a million laptops, that's 25 megawatts. Hmm, is this wonderful? You really need to worry about things like power at scale. Um, so, obviously we have to make these things cheap, uh, if we're going to be inexpensive, if we're going to be able to build them in any sort of quantity. So our big challenge is our infrastructure. Um, how do we get, what kind of power, how do we get connectivity? Obviously, as Thailand has unfortunately been demonstrating, political instability is also a major challenge. We have to worry about physical environment. Um, kids don't get on school buses in the developing world, they walk, walk uh, home. We would like the machine to survive getting rained on, at least when closed. Um, so we worry about, about that 
sort of thing. You will notice it has a rubber keyboard. It isn't. It isn't that it's. It's. it's uh, it isn't that the keyboard is is um, less expensive that way. Though that may be true. It's that we have to worry a lot about water and dust. And so a conventional keyboard will not survive. So in any case. Um, there are other indirect costs we worry about, which is if our software is big and bloated, we have a problem. Um, you, you know, uh, I think this study has shown how big and bloated things can get. Uh, we need to fight this tendency hard in Linux. Um, I believe people are beginning to take this more seriously. So now let's go down to where the costs go in most, in most laptops. And if you try to make a really, really inexpensive laptop, it turns out that sales and marketing would be your biggest single expense. So basically, we have Nicholas Negroponte traveling the world as our, as our, um, uh, uh, as our president of marketing. Uh, he's quite a, an amazing uh, 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 force of nature, shall we say. And then there's a lot of expense that goes into supporting big loaded software. Um, and another major cost is, is the display. The flat panel display on your machines are expensive. And as you'll see, they also won't even work where we need to be able to have a display work. Um, typical laptop today um, is often consuming 20 or more watts. Um, think one or two watts, OK? But so. Something a little over a year ago, we got together and, uh, to really go through our, our first major design review and understood that building a machine which looked like it was going to take a steady state power of something of order two to three watts was not good enough. And the reason why is the reality of the first point. A small kid cannot generate much power. We want to have we, we want to have a situation where the child can rely on power being available by being able to generate it themselves with some sort of a hand generator. It turns out that a crank in the, in the machine is a bad idea, so, but there are several generators being made as external devices. Um, we really want the kids to spend most of their time actually able to read and write and the like. So our goal has really been more like 10 to 1. I mean, if the, if the, if the child has to generate power, we want them to not be spending most of their time generating power, uh, generating power for the machine, um, that sort of thing. And then there's another observation we, we figured out, which was that the mesh network demands of the wireless be on, preferably all the time. Uh, that's an interesting problem. If the CPU is on all the time and the CPU is taking a couple of watts, hmm, the numbers don't add up very well. So, and in particular, if the child's not confident they'll be power when they need it, the first thing they'll do, being the inventable uh, creatures that they are, will be to try to disable the wireless so they'll have power when they need it. So, we uh, um, finally realized that most of the time when you look at your laptop, not much is going on. The screen's being refreshed and we're forwarding packets. And that's it. Most of the time, your CPU is doing nothing. Why is it on? Tell me again, why is your processor on? Why are the processors in the audience on now? How many of you are actually using your machines this instant? I don't see anybody stands go up. Well, yes, the wireless isn't working. Which means I actually have an audience. So necessity was a mother of invention. So from our point of view, we want to keep the processor off as much as possible when, it's, when you're in a situation where there isn't much power available. And leave the wireless able to work and possibly the display on so the kid can be reading yep. something. So how do we solve this problem? Well, there are two, two solutions to this. One of which, one piece of it is what's called a decon chip that we designed which allows us to leave the display on, the LCD on, and turn off the processor board. So we can have the screen on and turn off that CPU, which is, which even on a low power CPU is, would still be consuming a few watts. Um, that costs us, I don't know, something probably five or seven dollars, something like that, by the time all is said and done. 
Um, it's a small RAM chip that, that does the display. We also made a, a, a deliberate decision to use a wireless chip that nobody had heard of, made by Marvell. Um, it actually has an ARM9 processor in it and about a quarter megabyte of RAM. And so it gets able to forward packets even if the CPU is off. Okay? That's why we selected the Marvell chip. There is no other chip like it on the market right now. So, at the end of the day, depending upon what you're doing, we think we'll be down in the sort of one half to one and a half watts um, uh, area, depending upon whether you're using the screen or wireless, that sort of thing. So we think with 22 watt hour batteries, we should have pretty pretty long life. This is a typical number, obviously. Um, uh, obviously, a piece of this is how quickly can we wake up the machine? If we want the machine to appear to be alive, and yet we were suspending it right and left, we're going to have to wake up the processor quickly. And it turns out the geode is not ideal. It takes about 25 milliseconds to to do the wake up, but it takes about a frame time to get the display back from the um, from the decon chip. Um, so I think it'll be about 50, 70 milliseconds sort of things. So this is just at the at the edge of human perceptibility. I did some measurements on a, on an iPad handheld and I showed that from the time that it came out of reset uh, to when Linux was able to schedule um, uh, processes took about 10 milliseconds on a 200 megahertz stormer. Um, when I've asked the kernel community how long does it take to come out of suspend, um, it's, it's been a, it was a very fun tr trick question for a good part of the last year. Uh, the typical answer was in the one to two second range. The reality is, in, is it should be measurable in milliseconds. Okay. So there are other things we'll do, like drive the panel slowly whenever possible. This isn't particularly novel to us. Other people are doing this sort of thing. Um, obviously, change the rate at which we update the screen depending upon your you're doing it. The, the screen itself is very novel, as you'll see. Um, as I was talking about before, we have we're using this Marvell chip. Slightly more more detail about it. Um, we're you know uh, Marvell's implementing um, uh, a standard in development called 802.11s. Um, so it's um, able to do, do forward packets. Uh, without the processor on at all. We're just bringing this up right now in, in a more serious way. Um, that's what was going on last week. Um, we showed that it was technically possible to do, do by about eight or ten months ago. Uh, not only can it happen for real. Um, we obviously care about power management in a really, in a really serious way. Most notebooks are often taking ten seconds to wake up. I want to, I want to wake up in my hundred, under a hundred seconds, I think that's really cool. So, the um, other thing you obviously have to worry about was cost. So, you know, this is really made much more like, like a you know, consumer electronics. It's ejection molded plastic. Um, you need volume to afford to make the, the plastic um, uh, injection molds. They're hideously expensive. They're by far the cheapest way to make a, to make a a um, uh, thing if you're building it in high volume, but you can't afford to do it unless you are making a high, things in high volume. So you have a chicken and egg problem. You must have large volume in order to get prices down. Um, so um, we're also getting rid of most of the distribution costs. Basically, the the or what, what's happening is the countries will be ordering directly from Ponto, which is the ODM involved. Um, for those of you who don't know what ODM is, most laptops in the world are actually built by a set of companies who you've never heard of. Uh, Quanta Computer is the largest of them. Uh, one out of every three laptops in this room of almost any manufacturer that you carry a name is made by Quanta. So we have the 1,000 pound gorilla working with us. Um, it's really quite fun to see how that operation works. Oops. I hit the wrong button by accident. Uh, okay, so we think the power will be way down. Uh, the, 12, the 12 watt worst case is if you have all three USB ports sucking as much power as possible. The more typical thing is going to be down in, in, the, um, in the low ranges for most things we're doing. Um, it's not a very fast processor. Uh, it's sort of what we all had like five or seven years ago. 
that's a GeoGX2. Um, uh, we have 128 mega RAM. Uh, thankfully, open office is not something you want to inflict on an eight year old anyway. <laughs> um, so that's not a problem. So, in fact, most software just works. Um, there's a uh, megabyte of serial flash for the, for the um, uh, firmware, which we'll get to in a moment. Some USB ports, there's an SD uh, card slot, uh, the wireless um, audio, there's also a camera in the machine. And half a megabyte, half a gigabyte rather, of uh, NAND flash um, using Dave Woodhouse's JFFS2 file system. That does data compression, so for typical programs and data, it has feels more like a, something about twice that size. Um, we also have a new touch, uh, touch pad. Whether we're actually going to ship this or not, I don't know yet, because we're still slightly over, over budget. We may pull it out, I don't know. Um, but in fact, it, the uh, one here, which I have, can either be used as a conventional touch pad or the, the larger area can be used with a stylus um, for learning how to write, strangely. Uh, there's a VGA camera, it's the kids that don't take pictures. This is very, um, so you know, I guess you'll actually write. Okay, so I want to go speak a little bit about power systems design. This machine will take more or less anything nominally between 12 volts and 24 volts. You can plug it directly into a car battery. It isn't like where you need a, one of these, you know, bricks that are expensive. Um, that produces exactly 18.5 volts because, guess what, uh, lithium-ion really likes exactly the right voltage to charge. And we know what happens with lithium-ion if something goes wrong these days, as Ellen Cox <laughs> can uh, demonstrate it. So we are not using lithium-ion. Um, our original intent is going to use nickel metal hydride. We're also going to be using another chemistry that's just becoming available, which is not lithium ion, but um, uh, another lithium uh, uh, battery chemistry that is similarly safe and ecologically friendly. Lithium ion also ought to be uh, recirculated. Uh, we're, we're trying to make, the, we worry a lot about what the lifetime is. Um, a notebook manufacturer sees batteries as a profit center, and so they're perfectly happy to have you buy a new battery every year because you've recharged it three or, three or five hundred times, aren't they? <laughs> uh, that's not adequate for us. Um, so we worry a lot about uh, making sure that there's, it's possible to charge the battery many, many times. There's a gang charger uh, that we just got the first samples with of um, back, which uh, uh, has a car battery in it. You can charge ten batteries at once. That sort of thing is also the you know, solar cell panels that will fund it. Um, but also the ultimate um, uh, fallback for the kids is, is uh, generators. There's a crank being built. It's also a pull cord device that looks very promising if if you can make it uh, electrically robust. That uh, uh, some um, uh, media lab, uh, uh, former media lab folks uh, uh, have started a company called the Potenka to build, um, uh, that's much more efficient than a crank. Your crank only uses the little muscles in your arm, and a pull cord, you get to use your shoulders, or you can use your leg, that sort of thing, much better idea. The display itself, um, it is a new and novel display. Uh, it costs maybe 40% of what a panel of this size would normally cost. Most of the cost of an LCD is not the LCD. Most of the cost of what you have in front of you is, in fact, in the three color filters, in a fluorescent light bulb, which is high voltage and therefore requires an inverter, and that costs money, uh, and how to drive the electronics. And what's more, a conventional display does not work in bright sunlight, and most Many or most kids in the developing world get taught summer all of the time out of doors. So we have to have a display that could actually be used in bright sunlight. So conventional flat panels, even if we could afford them, which we can't, don't work. Uh, Mary Lou Jepson, who's our CTO, has invented a new form of LCD. In color mode, uh, it's backlit. 
and we have this funny pattern you see, uh, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, and so on. Um, uh, in uh, uh, front lip grayscale mode, it's a 200 dpi display. Okay, so this thing is 1200 by 900 resolution, so we have a lot more pixels on the screen than most uh, most of the laptops in this room. We want people to be able to read books nicely. Um, that sort of thing. In color mode, depending upon the ambient lighting, the resolution is anywhere from about 800 by 600 if there's no ambient light. Remember, in this situation, you actually still have intensity information occurring in every pixel. So the effective resolution, spatial resolution, is not a simple... There isn't a simple function where you say, oh, I just meant I have one-third of the pixels, therefore it works out to the following resolution. So as the ambient light goes up, the color saturation goes down, but the effective resolution of the display is going up. This is a complex situation. However, if you do test patterns in a fully dark room with backlight, the worst case is around 800 by 600 sort of resolution. Um, uh, in, in a lot of other environments, it's, it's effectively somewhat higher. The power consumption is very low. Um, we do not use the uh, fluorescent light bulbs, we use LEDs. Uh, they are color matched LEDs, but we don't care that the color fidelity is exact. And so we can take basically all of the manufacturer, um, all of what the LED manufacturer does. So it costs us a dollar or two for the strip of 12 LEDs, which are also replaceable because part of the problem is in places like Libya, um, the lifetime of the LEDs at elevated temperature is expected to be something like you know, three to five years. So they may need to be replaced once during the life of the machine. And that's possible to do. So we can actually replace that pesky backlight if should it fail. Um, so at worst case, this display consumes about one watt of power. Okay, most of your displays in the audience here are taking between like six and eight watts of power. Um, uh, in grayscale mode, at, 20, at 25 hertz refresh, um, this display takes about 100 milliwatts. Okay, so this is a fundamentally different flavor display than you're used to. Um, as I said, part of the trick of making our power budget is being able to turn off the CPU. Obviously, we have to leave the power, the, the DRAM being refreshed, but but not active. Um, and so there usually, there's usually a chip between the CPU and a TFT called the TCON. Um, we added a megabyte of memory and ended up with what we call as a, a, a DCON. And it drives the funny pixel thing for us. Um, it also can do some color anti-aliasing, um, that sort of thing. So um, this is part of how we get to the point where we can leave the display on and turn the CPU off. So we're going you know, to do suspend the RAM. So, let's see. So, you know, this is sort of the difference between what would normal, would normally be. So you have the decon and the native RAM. Um, the, other, the other ASIC we built is a thing called CAFE. Uh, this is called sliding down the slippery slope. Um, the, uh, the Geo turns out to have a man flash controller, which, shall we say, sucks. Um, so we had to do something. And, once we had to build a chip to uh, interface to NAND ourselves, uh, we also, um, uh, the countries wanted expandable uh, uh, flash, so we had an SD and also a camera interface um, out of the whole thing. So that's another chip we did. The dual, dual mode display is actually usable in sunlight, and that, for example, is a picture of uh, a real classroom. Um, out in the sunlight. Um, this shows conventional uh, IBM ThinkPad in bright sunlight and how much you get to see, and there's our display next to it. Okay, so um, I'll quickly run through what, you know, we did a lot of, oops, I guess we've lost some of our pictures. My, uh, lap, my regular laptop's in the shop. And I, having real trouble. Um, this is what a production line looks like. This is, this is the first machine uh, built in November. Uh, I had fun watching them build the second build uh, three or four weeks.
weeks ago uh, of machines. We went through a whole pile of pictures here from the be able to see of different mechanical designs. Um, side. Um, and so a lot of the mechanical improvements will be in the next so-called BTES 3. We worry a lot about um, safety. Uh, there's no hazardous substances uh, in this. We're trying to make something that doesn't have sharp corners or edges in case, in case uh, somebody falls onto it. We're trying to make it as moisture and dust and dirt resistant as we can. That sort of thing. You will note things like a slap, one rope, and you have a shoulder harness for this guy. That's why the two holes. Um, what the ultimate environmental difference between using conventional uh, textbooks with all the paper, which actually is not very logically friendly, friendly versus building electronics is a very interesting question. We're, gonna, uh, we're having some people look into this, what the environmental differences are. Making silicon is also interesting. So I don't know how what the wash is, but environmentally it's not, um, it's not obvious that it's any worse. Okay, I'm going to move on quickly to software. Um, this is, we care about open source from the point of view is we want the kids to be able to learn computing and the teachers to be able to do so. Uh, we want them to be able to, to those who are interested to really do things. Um, we're obviously worrying about software bloat um, in a serious way. Um, we're worrying a lot about system security because we're building a very large ecosystem I and mean, we hope to build five to 10 million machines next year. And that would be, make us a very big target. The other problem is theft, where we'd like to be able to detect theft in, in, uh, in a way. Uh, Sun opened up what's called open firmware without even a press release. So we're using that rather than a conventional, conventional BIOS. We had used Linux's bootloader for a while. Um, um, uh, and, uh, but open firmware ended up being a, a better bet. Linux is big enough that getting everything shoehorned into one megabit uh, or one megabyte flash was an interesting challenge. Um, we care a lot about having complete control. We're using Linux BIOS and open firmware for this. And this allows us complete control over the resume path. Um, and so we aren't running through ACPI stuff, which when we measured it was tens of milliseconds. Uh, even if the BIOS doesn't do other stupid things, I've noticed BIOSes that seem to want to sit there for 10, uh, 10 seconds for arbitrary reasons, probably having to do with the worst case that some device out of some USB might, might ever do. We also want kids to be able to see how machines really work. There's a basic set of applications being worked on. Um, and um, a user environment Remember that our user interfaces have been designed for adult, developed country office workers, not six or seven or eight year olds who are just learning to read. Do you think that this is a good match, folks? Do you think our conventional desktops, whether they're GNOME or KDE or Vista or Macintosh, are a good match to young kids? Don't think so. What we care about is um, uh, enabling collaboration between the kids and their teachers in a really serious way. Um, and a UI that's, that's approachable and discoverable by the kids. Um, there's a concept of a Zoom interface where this is the local machine and you can see your buddies and then everybody who's on the local uh, mesh. So we are bringing the, the facilities for collaboration and making collaborative applications really very far forward in the, in the UI. So again, this is, um, uh, you know, the uh, different sort of modes, and this is a, a mock-up of the journal that's being built right now. Um, so here, you, you, in the upper right-hand one, you're seeing a bunch of uh, sets of kids working around common activities, whether they're browsing the web or painting or stuff like that. Um, if your application is big, slow, and power-hungry, I'm afraid that you're out of luck. We often have a lot of choices for any given tool. We obviously care about small and simple. Uh, so Abby Word is very nice, but it's too much for a seven-year-old. It's great for my 12-year-old, by the way. She uses Abby Word in preference to either Microsoft Office or OpenOffice. 
just because uh, for a 12 year old, uh, that seems to be heavy word, but it's just about the right thing. But for a seven year old, it's too much. So the heavy word folks are building a nice, simple version for the younger kids. Which is great. And again, there's also a collaborative aspect to heavy word these days. There's lots of ways in which we can uh, use help. Uh, I have machines to give to people who, who, uh, um, who are helping us. Um, I even have a couple I'll probably uh, give, give away while I'm here. Um, we, some people question, well, why do we use uh, uh, GPK and Pango? It turns out that has the best localization ability. We care about languages in a way that, that um, uh, language coverage in a way that is really you know, fundamentally working on a huge. Um, and, oh, that's really too bad. Um, you know, the two things I really wanted to show most, I can't show. I have this, I have this wonderful logo for people who, who work on blood. It has an overweight tux, very sad, with the international symbol of, you know, well, so, you know, this is bloatbusters. You know, who are you going to call? You know, we call on ourselves. Let's fight bloat. We want to keep, we want to keep Tux his svelte, slightly pudgy self. Um, well, it was, it was uh, in the files that didn't, it was in the presentation, so it lost. Uh, Macintoshes have their problems, what can I say? Macintoshes have their problems. <laughs> Okay, um, we care a lot about end-to-end -end services. We think of servers as, as performance optimizations rather than being necessary. So for example, our chat system we're worrying about uses a Jabra-like or a protocol, but um, will work even when you don't have a server accessible. Because we want kids who are in a village someplace uh, away from the school to be able to still chat, right? So think about that sort of thing when you're doing things. We really can't have system management in, the, in any uh, formal way. Um, uh, courtesy of things like Abahi and Anycast and so on, a lot, of, a lot of the manual configuration really can go away now. So we hope to, um, or where we are now is we just built our second build of, of machines. There'll be a third build later in the spring, at which point we'll do uh, much larger uh, education trials, um, and it looks like um, end of July is when we should end up in, in high volume mass production. And I want to I want to end by saying thank you. This project, without your efforts over many years, would not be possible. So thank you all. The pixels are packed very carefully. If you do, if you do the math, you can just fit that into a megabyte. <laughs> uh, good question. <laughs> a very nerdy question. <laughs> uh, but yes, the, uh, LCDs give you, uh, in reality, about six bits of ratio. Okay, so that's that's the answer to how that works, barely. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, to begin with, I mean, a lot of applications still need local. Uh, okay, the question is, is how do you do localization um, if you're using mostly images? It's indeed the case that, that icons are not completely transferable culturally. They're more so than, than um, text is. 
Um, but yeah, I can imagine that we're going to have to, to build different icons for, for it. Um, understand, we want the kids to learn to read and write, we really do. It's just that we have the kid, the machine has to be usable by a child who hasn't, who's just in the process of learning. Right? One last question. Uh, gentleman there, the red, red shirt. Yeah. Well, they actually, right now, they break off easily. Um, <laughs> this is not a feature. In the next build, we're making them rubber, so they'll bend, <laughs> and they'll bend enough to push them to push them around on their on the axis. Um, like that again, that's a very good question. We, uh, these were not strong enough. I mean, yeah, there have been people who have been taking these machines and dropping them on the marble floors. Um, yes, on purpose. I mean, we have several hundred machines have, after they went after they went through you know thermal testing and so on and so forth, ended up being tested and told destroyed, and told destroyed, so we could figure out what needed to be strengthened. Okay. Now a lot, a few of the strengthenings are in this version. The next version, the so-called B-Test 3 machines, uh, will have most of the results of, of that work, making a, a more robust machine. It takes a long time to modify injection molding um, uh, uh, molds. Um, the lead time on those are quite long, measured in months. So you, you can turn new PC boards much faster. And you can do sheet metal much faster, but new plastic, oh, it's expensive and it takes a long time. Thank you all.